Hello dear listeners and welcome to another episode of Field Notes, the weekly podcast on all things agribusiness from the Hindu business line. I am your host T.R. Vivek. Right, uh, how has 2021 been for Indian agribusiness in general and agri-tech companies in particular? There was of course the continuing uh, protests by farmers that ended in the repeal of the three signal farm bills. How did it go down with India's agri-private sector? How did, uh, you know, did Indian agri-tech break any new thresholds on the road to maturity? And what prospects does 2022 hold? To discuss all that, we have with us today Venki Ramachandran. Venki is an independent consultant who advises agri-businesses and agri-tech firms on strategy, market access and fundraise. Uh, he also runs the weekly newsletter Agri-Business Agri Matters. Do check it out. Uh, he is based in Hyderabad, but uh, he is here in Chennai to soak up a bit of the city's December season. Yeah. Venki, welcome to Chennai. Thank you, thank you. Uh, how's, how's the Kacheri hopping been? Good, it just started actually. Yeah, I mean I, I grew up here, so okay. I used to play in the season. Okay. Yeah. You seem to have lost your voice listening to music. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been you know, uh, traveling and, and also uh, staying up all night for, uh, for a few uh, bus emergencies. Okay. So yeah, I lost a bit of voice, but yeah, I hope you'll catch up. <laughs> in uh, in uh, Carnatic music terms, how would you describe uh, 2021 for uh, Indian agribusiness? Uh, Interesting question. See, actually, the you know alagne all was very great, right? And and then after after a good a good alagne, when you when the kirtan starts, right? And and you you almost realize that with the you know uh, you know with with the, with the nerval that people singing, uh, everyone is trying to sing a different nerval, right? And nerval sometimes has to go into a, a kalpana swaram, and that's where new startups are coming in. Kalpana swaram is yeah abstract yeah. interpretation. Abstract of interpretations, and where that's where your 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 agri tech startups are having their own kalpanas for us, mm -hmm. trying to find new ways to uh, make sense of what's happening in the space and come up with different ways to solve the problem. Now, you know, all, all together, did, did we achieve the whole country or did we really create something, anything? I think that's where the real question is. And I think, you know, perhaps we may not get an objective answer, but everyone is trying, trying to sing their own songs mm -hmm. and play their own tunes. Mm -hmm. Uh, has has Indian agri tech in particular uh, has it crossed the varnam stage? Is it is it starting to sing uh, or or make progress towards a full fledged uh, ragam tanam pallavi? See, in about in FY twenty, right, agri tech startups in India uh, about raised about two point one billion. Right. Right. Now the thing is, you know, now that you're talking about Carnatic music, right? We have Ari Kodi who pioneered a certain structure. Right. right. Now. And that structure has been there for almost several years. So he sort of formatted, formatted, the, model and formatted the model Kachiri. Right. Mm -hmm. Now what happens is when new players come in, they come in with first radical ideas. They want to change the entire grammar. They want to change they want to. Things. They want to uh, uh, sing the Tukada first. Yeah, they want to sing the Tukada first or they want to directly start off with one song and then get off to a different song in the Alak Nacer and traverse through multiple ragas while there, it, which may not fit their model. But the funniest thing is, you know, when you see uh, agri tech startups that are raising funding, right? Like inevitably, the funding is going towards that part of the model which is already being the default, mm -hmm. right? The default structure, right? Which is where uh, your traditional uh, middleman kind of an operations, right? Where you have the traders and the you know anathias or the commission agents or or the input trade traders. These are the traditional pillar posts of the uh, you know agri sector. You know, these are the nerve centers of agri sector, right? And one would almost expect that agri tech startups would come in and, and disrupt that ecosystem. But you know, it's it's strangely that the money has gone towards those startups which are trying to digitize the current uh, pillars, the current nerve centers. So in other words, so you know, the startups that are solving for the market access problem. Yeah, I mean, market like access like is a big it's a big word, right? See, today, I, for easy sake, let's break this up into two parts. There's an upstream where you have from the you know from the agri input companies value chain right in terms of where an agri input which is be it a seed or a, or a this is typically pre harvest pre harvest right a pre harvest kind of a one and then there's a post harvest right? today if you see where the money has been flowing it has been flowing towards more towards the downstream post harvest right if you see the numbers close to about 1.37 billion were raised in the post harvest value chain whereas about uh, you know one third of it about three three hundred million or something what raised in the pre-house 
But the good thing is the number of deals have been increasing in the pre-harvest. In, in other words, we try to create, I mean if you really look to cut the long story short, we try to imagine a new structure, a maze of Sydney and Karnatic structure, right? But eventually we ending up digitizing the, the existing structures. So, I mean, that's my, my bone with the, you know, with all the funding ecosystem and I, that's a dialogue I often have with the VC community also, right? That you're ending up digitizing the status quo, uh, you know, digitizing the current structures, which may be good, right? Uh, you know, which has its own pluses and minus. But how does it really change the ground underneath? No, that's the bigger question. But um, that digitization is also a must, right? You know, you can't have a... Uh, modern agri-business chain without digitizing the parts that are being digitized now or where the money is flowing now? No, no nobody is saying no to digitization, right? But the, the question, essential question is what problem are you solving? Today, these businesses that though, that have been running in... Also, also, if you could give an example of what we are talking about here, when we say digitizing some bits of the downstream yeah. part of agri-business, what are, what are those and uh, offer some examples of some companies sure, that are... Sure. See, if you take a classic case of, uh, you know, in the downstream, right, you have a, let's say, Chennai-based company called PayAgri. Now, PayAgri, if you if you really say they are operating at the uh, downstream end of the value chain. What do they do? So now, they they tie up with FPCs and FPOs, uh, you know, with, with chilies and, 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 and then they ensure that those, those supplies are given to uh, players in the, you know, like, you know, your Rajima masala kind of players, right? So they do the supplying at the other downstream end. They, they procure from FPCs and they do some, some bit of value addition and, and, and then they give it to the buyers. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, recently they have, I mean, they, they about, uh, there's another company in based out of Gujarat, Bombay, which is into textiles. They acquired about 51% stake in the company. Now, that's just one example of how a downstream is. A downstream is typically where I set up uh, my own private mandis or I try to digitize the operations of the ahatiyas or the traders. Uh, or I offer a, a virtual marketplace for these traders to, to, to run their businesses. So that, those are classic examples of a downstream. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, uh, then my question is, what is the problem if money is, is if VC money and investor money is going into that part of, of agribusiness? See, <coughs> you know, we have to really understand a, a lot and, of... Uh, and if I may, why do you think, if I've got you right, why do you think it is like putting the uh, cart before the horse? See, the reason why I am I'm, I'm kind of pointing towards that is, if you really see fundamentally how our agri, agri markets have evolved over time, right? Uh, you know, if you see the APMC, they are all a 40-year-old beast. Right? They've taken 40 years. It's it's as much as, you know, I mean, the, the nearest metaphor I give is, uh, you know, if you go to Meghalaya, right, you see those living root bridges, right? And each, and if you really, and I spent uh, some time there last year, uh, a few years back, actually. And if you really see how the farmer, how the people there construct that bridge, right? It's about a 20-30 year project where they slowly move the, the roots in such a way that roots take over and build that structure. Uh, likewise, every APMC is about a 30-40 year old nexus of relations that have been built over time and has over time calcified into certain structures that only benefit few, right? And if you really look at the, uh, you know, talk from purely from an objective lens of how markets are designed, right? Today, we all know that in the... Indian agricultural market is fundamentally flawed for the for the simple reason that it's there are we are talking about thin markets where there are no competition. I mean, if you really talk about uh, you know the Nobel Prize winning economist Al Roth, right? He talks about two markets. One is a thick market and the thin market. A thin market has very less differentiation and few traders, whereas a thick market has a lot of competition and new players. For 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 a long time, whether we like it or not, agri agri businesses in in, in India and we trade largely has been a thin market where there are few traders who control the shots. Right. Now, now that is a, a fundamental asymmetry in, in the relation that, that you know, translates into in between the farmer and the trader. When you, when, you, when you describe it as a thin market, could you give an example, say, you know, you could even take onions for instance. Yeah. Uh, how onions, the onion market in Maharashtra is controlled perhaps by a handful of... Yeah, you, you, in onion markets, you can, you know, there's a Sholapur belt, there's a, a Nasik belt. And, and pretty much if you want to you know do business at scale, those are the guys who are running the shots. Right? Right. And now today, <coughs> they are, it's good that they are, are embracing coming up to speed with technology. But now what does that, you know, what does that do to the way prices are discovered in the market? Mm -hmm. 
prices, I mean, if you really look at the original intent behind farm laws, right, they were designed to make sure that there is a price integration between a deficit region and surplus region. Now, is that problem being solved is the first question. Now, then, so then there, there are other questions, right? In terms of today, even after after farm laws and even after ECA was revoked, we still saw how much of control they put on onion prices, right? So, you know, amidst all of this, then the, the fundamental question is there is a, a significant asymmetry between a trader as an entity and a farmer as an entity. Now, uh, that you know that advantage that asymmetry is has leads to a lot of structural problems what the is the asymmetry the asymmetry is in terms of who calls the shot and who gets to decide what's the price and who gets to decide what the quality is right so you see today so it's, so it's the trader decides completely yeah the, yeah the dice is loaded in the trader's in favor of the trader. see today if i buy uh, uh this pen right now the quality of this pen is, is determined by certain standards right whereas in in the produce case there is somebody, I mean, if I, if I go buy a certain produce, I don't have to convince, or, or the trader who is buying it, he doesn't have to convince that this is of a certain quality and I don't have to be convinced of something. The price does that thing, right? The moment I, I buy, I, this, a friend about me gifted me this pen for about, it, it's worth about 4K or something. Now, now, automatically that price is determined what is the right supply and demand. Now, the fundamental question in agriculture, as from my understanding, from my limited understanding, I mean, I've been only in this space since uh, about 2011 or so, uh, is that today price doesn't match the supply and demand and that goes back to the economics 101 when prices don't match supply and demand then what do you do right. so so those are the fundamental structural questions that that really underlie so so while it's great we are digitizing trade and we need to do further more and, and i think that way farm laws are also a good step in that direction mm -hmm. right but i think you know i mean I, I like to push the bar higher to see what can we really do you know, uh, farm loss was, uh, the repeal of the farm loss rather, was of course music to the ears of the protesting farmers. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, since you consult with uh, a lot of players in the private sector, how did it sound to the areas? No, <coughs> see many of them, uh, you know, there are two phases, right? The phase, one is... Uh, is there a sense of gloom and doom? Uh, because I, uh, I hear a lot of it. In, in, in some circles, you know, a lot of brisk beating that you know, look, this is again we have, we have plumped for status quo and uh, iska kuch nahi hoga, you know, and Indian agri is consigned uh, to be in this status quo forever, and we've lost a sort of a golden window of opportunity. Uh, is that the same sense that you get talking to people in the private sector? No, I think see many people have over time, you know. So there are some people, of course, who are who, who are really not so happy about it for various reasons. But overall, if you really see the way agriculture markets are, if you have spent time in the Mondays and if you if you if you are traveling, there is always a, a certain sense of optimism that now maybe you know we've gone past both sides. Right? Right. There are side we we went cargo over the farmless. There was a phase when we went thought that this is all doom. This is going to bring in a corporate cronyism of a different kind. Mm -hmm. But I think. It's good to go through that whole cycle so that now we can really look at the long-term questions, right? Mm -hmm. Because fundamentally, if you really look at, uh, you know, the, the reforms, is a, it's a very long, unfinished project. And I think this really brings it to a ground zero in terms of, uh, you know, moving really forward in this. So I don't see, while there are some players who have been expressed there, but, but those who are really in, attuned with the way agricultural markets are in this country know that this is, this is a long project. This cannot be solved in one year with a with a swing, you know, with with a band of a band of a law. So I, this, these are very complex problems. This this involves several stakeholders, right? I mean, if you really look at the way our policies have been framed, uh, you know, they go back to the roots go back to the even the constitution. There are certain constitutional elements, which is what Sharad Joshi has been arguing about and debating about before he passed away, right? And, and even still now, the the Krishkari Sangatna has been doing. So these are very long projects. They, they are tied to the federal structures there. So, uh, you know, to expect that uh, one law would change 40 years of uh, accumulated systems that have been built together it was it was an illusion anyway. Right. So, I think it's a good, good, I think, for me, I, I think optimistic that we are now at a stage where we've gone through the highs and lows. Now, we could probably, you know, really look at what to really, what kind of change we can really bring. No, in the uh, agribiz startup space, uh, what have been some of the most sort of exciting developments or fundraisers or companies that have sort of that have uh, took the next step or the big leap in 2021? What comes to your mind? No, they are quite extremely ambitious. 
and uh, and that's the that's the part that gets excite me excites me right uh, i mean i i i've been writing about this in the in my newsletters report you know there was this, i mean i'm a, a big movie buff uh, if you really look at the history of hollywood between 1920s and 40s right uh, when sound was introduced in cinema it led to an explosion of activity in the film film scene mm-hmm. right that like you have these uh, jewish moguls who all set up big large uh, enterprises that did film production distribution and also theater they had control over all the three i see a lot of parallels in that with respect to agriculture like today you talk to a, any startup he is talking about going going all the way to to see what can i do to own the access of the uh, the active ingredient which is the or or the seeds and and all the way to, to the production to controlling the process of production to finding the buyers and ensuring that they get a good you know margin yeah, everyone wants to be a platform now and that yeah. seems to be the buzzword yeah what i meant was you know um, uh, tell us about some of some of the exciting companies you know companies that that made a big leap in 2021 uh, some some interesting uh, deals or fundraisers or partnerships that you think could be exciting going forward no see one of the most recent one that was uh, buy a partner in microsoft mm. right that's like that's like as equivalent as two big, big big players coming together and trying to find collaboration in the areas of agribusiness and and seeing what kind of platforms can be built at massive scale I mean, if you if you if you really consider the fact that the amount of scale in, the, in which Bayer Bayer operates, yeah, and of course the largest, the, the largest play in the agri agri business in the world. Right. So that's one one example. Now it's Monsanto. Yeah. So it's coming together of one of the largest tech companies and yeah. uh, an agri company. So that is a huge part, a huge role, and and if you really see that as a downstream effect, right? Now today, uh, when this when this kind of a digital partnership is coming in, they are going to look at partnering with agri tech startups. as they channel partners right so which is going to bring in a huge amount of changes there and 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 not just that right if you talk if you see uh, you know how uh, let's say agri bazaar has been doing they are all partnering with governments so there have been a lot of uh, you know historically if you see talk to entrepreneurs agri tech entrepreneurs they've been you know like i when i was in the sector as a player when i was working for an agri tech startup the the mantra was never go to a government right because government is all then you know all the nexuses you don't want to you don't want to get your due, you will not get your dues so you're going to always be stay a, a miles distance from that but now if you see the amount of partnerships of the governments are happening today almost fitik nafed if you talk about the nafed how many star, car, startups are auctioning the producers for nafed how many startups are controlling if you take they have they have this been trying to control the, the you know the pulses in the in terms of the nafed by by in there so they are one, one of the buyers there and likewise so earlier from that from staying on uh, arms length distance between the government now everybody is getting extremely cozy and comfortable with governments so that's one big change so there are a lot of developments that have been happening which are in will which. will 2022 see uh, more investment and the emergence of deep tech agri tech startups uh, rather than merely populating the space of market access and aggregation and and, and supply chain uh, management yeah see uh you know uh, traditionally in the other way the funding goes as as far as i understand once a certain baseline set of problems are addressed then the top line level comes in right it's like once i build the the ground floor then the top floor comes in. right so so is is this space ready yes. you know is are, are the foundations in place for say you know agnext is an interesting agri tech company you know which operates you know the space of computer vision and and uh, quality control yeah and but they moved into trading which is surprising right. yeah. as i said everyone wants to be a platform yeah yeah i mean i mean that's see these are very hard problems uh, vicky are the are the foundations of uh, agri biz or agri tech in place in india for uh, uh, deep tech uh, startups to emerge yes i think a base a baseline level of uh, how much of agri tech platforms that can be built is, is already there the funding is already gone so now a deep tech in terms of uh, you know whether i see more deep tech not more into the space of quality because quality is a very tough problem to crack uh, and we can talk about that at some time later uh, but deep tech in terms of uh, you know uh, genomics to to do uh, uh, to sell to sell seed breeding right. or or players that are going with alternative proteins uh, or people who are trying with with alternative fertilizers that that are green fertilizers green chemicals right. green molecules so those are the kind of deep tech players who are right now uh, you know people who are coming up with new biologicals that are you know that are uh, 
uh, that don't leave so much of a residue compared to the traditional agro chemicals. Those are the kind of sectors where I, you can see more uh, money flowing in. What about satellite right. imagery? There seems to be a lot of, uh, I hear a lot of talk around, you know, sat, you know, hooking up satellite imagery to crop insurance and, you know, even performance management and early detection of, uh, of insect or pest attacks. See, I, I would temper that enthusiasm in some sense because I have actually played with that technology in, when I was earlier working in that space, right? Today, you can only get about 60 to 70 percent accuracy when you do it with the satellite imagery no matter what expensive tech you want to go in that. You still need somebody to do a ground truth. In. So there is a potential, but that potential needs to, you know, that technology needs to be also embedded with other models that will enable you to do ground work. Right. Today, uh, you know, there is a good amount of work that's happening on uh, geofencing, mm -hmm. where you could geofence every every acre and, and then identify. But, but it's not good for, again, anything that grows below the soil. Right. Anything that goes through the tubers, the, yeah, tubers, for instance, it doesn't work that. So, I mean, I wouldn't dismiss that completely, but but I still, I think, you know, like companies like Pixel, mm -hmm. uh, which is again, uh, you know, one of the space tech players, which raised a lot of money, uh, you know, has been giving a good shot at it. And there are a lot of players who are now saying that I will, uh, with a satellite, data, I'll give you your estimation of your yields, yeah, right. right? But but I, in the ground, I, I you know, it's not more than six or seven percent. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of lot of work ahead. And it can never alone solve a problem. It needs to go and complement with other technologies. Mm -hmm. That can, I mean, other technologies involve actually somebody going in and testing it and then correlating with the data. Right. Um, what do you mind are some of the three or four uh, trends in agri tech that we are likely to see in 2022? Uh, in both <coughs> in terms of uh, uh, investment ideas and uh, you know uh, the problems that startups are likely to focus on cracking. See now. Uh, earlier we had a horizontal broad set of uh, players, right, which looked at end to end, as I said, talked about from the Hollywood example, right, which is like very ambitious now. So now I think we are in a stage where all the basic low hanging fruits have been taken. Mm -hmm. So we could expect very specialized focused companies that are solving a particular value chain for a particular uh, crop or a particular value chain and they're going deep into it. Now you see, you can see another trend is, like you said, uh, life sciences is another sector where you could see a lot more investments. Uh, because traditionally in, in, in India, the funny thing in India is I, people who are in life science think it's an agriculture problem. People who are in agriculture see life science as an outsider problem. So that, you know, the space has always be, has always fallen within the cracks. Now uh, we can expect some more funding to come in, into that side. So uh, yeah, so th those are some of the trends there. I mean, I, overall I see today, uh, you know, much more uh, maturity in terms of how to deal with it. Like earlier, FPOs were, were like the, the big thing, like, right? And but people t now today have they they come and figured out what are the real challenges in, in operationalizing FPO and also bringing a digital la lens layer on top of it. So I think now we can expect some more maturity right, because we've barely scratched the surface. Barely scratched the surface. As far as FPOs are concerned, yes, yes. we have barely scratched the surface, and 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 a lot of structural issues still remain. Mm -hmm. But now, once a baseline of you know infrastructure is built. Maybe we can go a little more deeper, a little more smarter about how we are approaching these problems. Right. Right. Peggy, thanks a lot for joining us today on Field Notes. Sure. Uh, My pleasure. And uh, I hope uh, you enjoy the rest of the music season. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Uh, right, sisters, until we meet next week, goodbye and God bless. <laughs>